Yovan Buha. Buha. Yo, yo, I'm Yovan Buha, Lakers beat writer for The Athletic, and welcome to episode five of Buha's Block. We're already three weeks into this, and I hope you've been enjoying the podcast, be it on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or on YouTube. For today's episode, I'm going to be doing a giant mailbag, answering all of your questions. And as a reminder to have me answer one of your questions, all you have to do is send me a screenshot on Twitter that you have either followed me on YouTube, followed the podcast on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, uh, downloaded an episode, or left a five-star review. If you do that and it's an appropriate question, I will answer it. Without further ado, let's get into today's Lakers mailbag. All right, question number one is from at Calvin Leeboy on Twitter. Do you think the current starting five will be the starting five even when everyone is healthy? Is there any chance that AR gets benched for Vando when he comes back? Our defense with D'Lo, AR, and Rui starting is poop emoji. Well, I'm sorry to inform you, Leeboy, but I think the Lakers are going to stick with the current starting lineup, and I do believe that is the correct decision. Now, anytime we're talking lineup decisions, I'm a little hesitant to firmly make a statement just because we've seen the starting lineup fluctuate throughout the season, the rotations fluctuate throughout the season. So I'm a little skittish to, to say that Rui is for sure going to be the starter moving forward. And of course, if the Lakers go on a run here, there might be a situation, uh, be it a single elimination game or a playoff series where the Lakers need to make a lineup adjustment. Uh, So I would not be surprised if at some point they do make a change. But I I think that the key factor here is this group finally has some continuity. This has been the starting lineup since February 3rd uh, against the Knicks. And having about a six-week period to look at this group, to form some continuity, to rediscover some of the success that they had last season. I just don't think it would make sense to go away from that, especially so late in the season when you've had this group potentially for about two months by the time Jared Vanderbilt potentially returns. So while I think Jared Vanderbilt should get looks uh, next to the other four starters, I think he should be the first sub off the bench and come in for Rui at about the seven or eight minute mark, depending on the matchup. I think the Lakers have to stick with this group because as we saw with Vando, when he came back from his initial heel injury, it did take him several weeks to figure out his offensive role, to find his rhythm and to really start impacting games defensively the way that he did last season. So to assume he's going to come in and just do that again from day one, from returning from another lengthy absence, I think would be a little optimistic. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm not saying it's not possible, uh, but I think you know, Vando is likely going to have some type of ramp up period once he's cleared to return. And then he'll likely be on a minutes restriction, as we've seen uh, when most players come back from injuries uh, on the Lakers. They come back with like a 15, 20 minute minutes restriction, and then they start to ramp up after a few games. So depending on when Vando returns, if he does return, I just think putting him back in the starting lineup is going to be a little tricky. So I think the Lakers are going to stick with Rui, but I could see them having a quick trigger in terms of bringing Vando in, uh, closing games with Vando. And again, depending on the matchup, potentially starting Vando, if that's what uh, that particular matchup calls for. Uh, But I I got some numbers here for you. So the lineup with AD, LeBron, uh, Rui, Austin Reeves, and D'Lo is a plus 6.1. So they've outscored opponents by 6.1 points per 100 possessions, uh, according to Cleaning the Glass. That is in 510 possessions. So not as big of a sample size as you'd ideally like uh, by this point in the season, but still a a solid sample size. And looking at the numbers, they are in the 49th percentile in offensive efficiency, which is kind of surprising because this is such a a firepower heavy group where you have five guys who could drop 20 points on any given night. They did that against the Pelicans right before the All-Star break, the first starting lineup since 1993 to do that. Uh, So I was a little surprised to see they're only in the 49th percentile as a unit offensively, uh, but they're actually in the 58th percentile defensively so they've been slightly below average offensively and slightly above average defensively doesn't really make sense doesn't really pass the eye test Uh, but looking at some of the numbers they have a really good effective field goal percentage Uh, so just high level shot making with this group right like you have LeBron and AD but you also have 
Austin and D'Lo, guys who can uh, attack from the second side, guys who are good catch and shoot players, guys who can attack in the pick and roll. Uh, then you also have Rui, who often has a mismatch uh, in, in the front court where, you know, he whether it's, it's duck-ins and seals or he's posting someone up uh, or he's just taking someone uh, off the dribble in, in ISO, he can attack uh, an opponent's weakest front court guy that's typically a mismatch for him. So really good shot making with that group and then they've actually been really good at not fouling and that's been a strength of the lakers overall but with this particular lineup it's been one of their strongest lineups in terms of not fouling so i think this is the lineup they should stick with uh, if only because to me these are their five best players these are their five highest paid players and I know that uh, Vando does solve some of the defensive perimeter issues, but he does come with some question marks offensively. I, quickly, the, the numbers on Vando at the three. So same lineup with Vando, uh, basically last season starters, plus 39.6 points per 100 possessions. Uh, so that's a monster number. Now, they've only played 68 possessions. Uh, this is, again, according to Cleaning the Glass. And they've been dominant with offensive rebounding, and that's partly because of Vando. Uh, also a good effective field goal percentage. Uh, they've struggled with turnovers, though, and I think part of that is is some of the spacing uh, issues that come with, with playing Vando with the other four. Uh, but they've also been elite at not fouling. I think in an ideal world, Jared Vanderbilt doesn't start the season injured or doesn't get injured uh, in that Boston game. And the Lakers either start him from the beginning of the season and he's just the, the starting small forward all year, or he starts in that New York game. Because as I've reported, uh, the plan for the Lakers was actually to start Jared Vanderbilt in that Boston game before LeBron and AD were late scratches. And then once they were, the plan was to start him in that New York game. But of course he gets injured in the Boston game, can't play in the New York game, obviously has been out since then. Uh, and then they go with Rui, who is their plan B option. At that point, they just realized Torian Prince wasn't producing uh, well enough to continue starting and, and that he needed to move to the bench and, and have his role downsized. It's a bit of a what if scenario for the Lakers season of like, if Vando doesn't get injured either time, I think they probably have a few more wins and uh, that there's a bit more continuity there. And, and this group looks a little different. They're definitely better defensively. Uh, but with him likely returning now deep into the, the season, you know, potentially final week, final couple weeks, uh, I think it's it's too much of an ask to uh, start him over Rui or, or even Austin. Like, I don't see Austin moving to the bench, to be clear. I, I guess this question was centered around Austin's moving to the bench. I don't see that happening. I, I think Austin and D'Lo are the Lakers' third and fourth players in some order. It fluctuates night to night. I know there are defensive concerns with that backcourt. I know there are rebounding concerns and, and just some size and athleticism concerns. But those two are going to continue starting. They are too valuable. They are too good. The talent gap between them and the fifth best player, whether that's Rui, whether that's Vando, whether that's someone else that you want to pick, like it's just such a big gap between those two and anyone else on the roster. They're just so good offensively and so important to this team that I don't see either one of them moving to the bench. Again, barring uh, maybe a matchup specific situation that calls for uh, someone else stepping in. But I don't think that's Vando comes back in Austin or D'Lo or Rui moves to the bench. Okay, now question number two from at let 11 and O. What are the chances of LeBron staying in LA if the Lakers don't hit on a superstar in the offseason with the picks they've stocked up? I think they're high. And for a longer answer on this subject, you should check out my conversation with Sam Amick of The Athletic. Uh, we go for about 20 minutes on LeBron and his future in LA, his relationship with Jeannie Buss, their dynamic, and why it makes the most sense for both sides for LeBron to remain a Laker for at least a couple more years. Now, what I will say is LeBron has been a fan of the three-star model for quite some time now. That is partly how the Lakers got in this mess uh, with the Russell Westbrook trade. And I'm not gonna relitigate who is at fault and who is at blame. I think the blame pie uh, incorporates several parties and it's it's not just on LeBron, it's not just on the Lakers uh, and it's not just on Russ. Like that, there was a, a lot of factors at play uh, with that situation. But since then, LeBron has been a fan of going after a Kyrie Irving or a Damian Lillard and more recently a DeJounte Murray and, and a Zach Levine. So as I previously reported, the Lakers have plans to pursue Trey Young, Kyrie Irving, 
and Donovan Mitchell this summer. That, of course, will require one of those three to become available. And I think there are a few different ways that could happen. With Donovan Mitchell, there's been a lot of speculation that he isn't going to stay in Cleveland and that maybe even if they make a deep playoff run, he could be available. I do think the two New York teams would have the inside track on landing Mitchell. He is from the tri-state area. And it seems like the Knicks or the Nets are, are likely to get him if he does leave Cleveland. Uh, but then I look at Trey Young and there's the clutch connection. Uh, he's been to Laker playoff games before. Uh, he is someone that would make a lot of sense next to Anthony Davis and even to a lesser extent, LeBron James uh, as that number three guy, a guy who can take a bulk of the offensive load off of LeBron run pick and rolls with AD, be protected defensively by AD. And the Lakers and Hawks have had some recent trade conversations uh, leading up to uh, this past trade deadline, originally centered on DeJounte Murray, but you could basically pick up where you left off with those and then add in now three picks for the Lakers and potentially put an Austin Reeves or a Max Christie on the table if you are landing a better player uh, in Trey Young. Uh, and then there's Kyrie. And uh, I mean, he just hit a huge shot. One of the craziest game winners I've ever seen. Uh, basically a left-handed running floater hook shot. Like I don't even know how to describe that from the free throw line over uh, Nikola Jokic. And that, that was just an insane shot, but also a reminder of how skilled Kyrie is, how clutch Kyrie is, and how much the Lakers could use uh, that type of player. And we know LeBron has had interest in Kyrie dating back to the 2022-23 season. The Lakers didn't end up landing him. He gets traded to the Mavericks. And the Lakers have made multiple attempts to try and get Kyrie, but it just hasn't worked out. But maybe this summer, maybe Dallas flames out in the playing tournament. Maybe they flame out in round one. And that front office, that organization has to take a, a cold, hard look at, you know, is this Kyrie-Luka tandem tenable? And, and is this something that we can be successful with if our two-year sample size is not making the playoffs and losing in the play-in or losing in the first round? So I say that all to provide the context of, to my knowledge, LeBron is on board with the three-star build, and that is what he wants the Lakers to do this summer. But the key here is LeBron's decision date for his $51.4 million player option is June 30th, which is before free agency. So there is a chance the Lakers could pull off a big-time trade around the draft, which is about a week beforehand. But if not, LeBron is going to have to make a decision be it opting in and extending, opting out and re-signing, opting out and leaving, whatever it is, uh, he's going to have to make that decision by June 30th. And there's going to be some conversations with what are the Lakers' plans, uh, what's going on with Darvin Ham, how realistic is adding a third star. Like the Lakers are going to have to do their due diligence whenever the season ends. But between that point and June 30th, they're going to have to make calls and, and figure out what's going on with Atlanta, what's going on with Dallas, what's going on with Cleveland. Is there another star that kind of comes out of the blue that becomes available? Lakers can kind of sneakily get involved in, and, and that tends to always happen. There's always the one team uh, that loses a little bit earlier than expected, and their star becomes disgruntled, and that player is potentially available. So there are, are several ways that this can all play out, uh, but I do believe, uh, be it opting in and extending or opting out and re-signing, that LeBron is going to be a Laker for at least a couple more years, if not three more years. And whether they add that third star or not, like that is going to be a factor. I think it is something that he wants, but I don't think it's going to ultimately be the deciding factor. LeBron wants to be a Laker moving forward, and the Lakers want him to be a Laker moving forward. And with both sides on the same page in that regard, I think it's going to happen. On to question number three from friend of the show, Nick Atanatskovich, what's your all-time favorite Lakers moment? This is a fun one. I will give you two. I will give you one uh, childhood memory and one uh, adult slash professional memory. So childhood memory, there are several. I would say uh, the first one that comes to mind is the 2001 Lakers championship. That was the first season that I got into basketball. Uh, one of my friends was a big Laker fan, and I started playing basketball uh, like Thir end of third grade going into fourth grade and my fourth grade what was that 2000 2001 year uh, so I remember like he called me before the first Lakers preseason game and it told me like hey it's going to be on tonight at, at 7 30 like I I didn't know anything about basketball or, or the schedule or whatnot so I remember watching that first preseason game and going from there so from that 2000 2001 season that was my first season I consumed basketball and fell in love with it. Uh, I was 
a Laker fan. I was a huge Kobe and Shaq fan, especially Shaq. Shaq's my favorite player of all time. I don't really get into my fandom too much. I have put it to the side uh, since becoming a professional journalist in 2011, but grew up a huge Shaq fan. Shaq's my favorite player. The probably my last fan moment was the 2010 finals, uh, rooting for the Lakers against the Celtics. That was the end of high school for me. So that was my senior year. And then going into college, I kind of made a decision of like, I'm just going to be an NBA fan. I'm going to be a fan of storylines. I'm going to be a fan of being objective and just covering the game, consuming the game. Uh, from a more national perspective. So uh, I made that shift going into my freshman year of college, but basically up through high school, uh, I was a big Laker fan. So again, that 2001 championship run going 15 and one, that was a, that was a big one for me. 2004, Derek Fisher, the, the shot uh, against the Spurs in game five of the Western Conference semifinals. It's probably the loudest I've ever screamed. And it was also sweet for me because 2003, Lakers lose to the Spurs in the Western Conference semifinals. And that was the first time I cried. That was uh, fifth grade for me. And I, I remember, uh, you know, or I think it was fifth, uh, but I, like, I cried after that game. They, they lose in game six uh, to the, the Spurs at home. They get blown out. I think it was like a 28-point loss. And I remember crying. So th those are some of my, my fond memories. Uh, 2001 championship, 2004, Derek Fisher shot. 2010 being the Celtics. I really hated the Celtics growing up. Uh, hate, I would not wear the color green. Uh, I was a true Laker fan in that sense. So those are those are some of the the core memories for me growing up. And then as a professional, I would have to say the two moments that stand out to me are Kobe's final game when he dropped sixty. Uh, I was there. Uh, I was. Uh, I actually had the highest seat in the building. Uh, Lakers put me in the rafters for that one. I was working for Fox Sports, and uh, it was on one hand like unfortunate that I was so far removed from the action, like. Those media seats are above the nosebleeds. They are literally the highest seats in the arena. But the, the cool part of that was I was able to see the entire arena and, and the entire uh, reaction to every Kobe shot in the second half, in the fourth quarter. And as he was going on that run in the fourth to go up to 45, 50, 55, 60, and you have all the celebrities there going crazy, you know, Jay-Z, Kanye, like every, everybody that was there, it was just an insane environment and, and the loudest I've ever experienced Staple Center slash crypto.com arena. So that one to me stands out in particular. And then the other one would be LeBron breaking Kareem's record, because as I've mentioned before, we got brought onto the floor, us as in the Lakers beat writers, we, we got to go on the floor immediately after. So LeBron makes the shot, they stop the game and they have that ceremony for him and PR brings us on the floor. And that was my first time, like I've been on the floor hundreds of times at this point, be it at crypto.com arena or, or opposing arenas, but I've never been on the floor with it packed like that with all eyes, you know, not on me, but on LeBron, but like I was 10 feet in front of LeBron and just kind of looking around and seeing what, what the players see, what the coaches see, what, what everyone sees who's you know playing the game. That was a really cool experience for me. So being able to witness LeBron breaking the record and Kareem being there and, and just the, the NBA history, but then also getting the experience of going onto the floor, standing at half court and just looking around, soaking it all up, taking it all in. So those would be a few of my favorite memories as a fan growing up and then as a professional uh, covering the, the team. Question four at Lakers season 824. How do the Lakers feel about Max Christie's development in comparison from his rookie season to now? This is a really good question. I've made it pretty clear that I'm fond of Max. I believe in him. Uh, I think he profiles as a good 3 and D uh, wing, someone that uh, I think right now is probably looking more like a good 3 and D bench wing. But I would not be surprised if he eventually develops into a fifth starter. Like I don't think that's out of the question with his development. Now, I think there's a little bit of a split here between the front office and the coaching staff. As we've seen with the coaching staff, he's had a bit of an inconsistent role. Earlier in the season, the coaching staff was trying to use him more as an on-ball guy, more of a pick and roll threat uh, coming off of his summer league success as a higher usage player. Uh, but as we saw, he kind of struggled uh, taking on that greater responsibility. It wasn't as effective as an ISO guy, as a pull-up guy, uh, as a guy creating advantage just with his off the dribble ability. Uh, so he's been properly slotted, I think, 
now more as a catch and shoot guy, a good cutter, a good offensive rebounder, and someone who more so is playing in the corners, uh, spacing the floor. As I've reported, the Lakers have now not included Max Christie in trades at the past two trade deadlines. Teams have asked about him. Teams have wanted him as a a throw-in into different deals. And then going back to the Kyrie trade, uh, where the, the Nets wanted both Austin Reeves and Max Christie, and the Lakers did not want to include either of them in a potential Kyrie trade. So uh, Max is someone internally with with ownership in the front office uh, that is viewed highly. I don't think the coaching staff views him in the same way. To me, he has been a more effective player in limited doses than a Cam Reddish, uh, than a Torian Prince, uh, but that has not been reflected in his playing time and and what the the way the Lakers have used him. He's an interesting player just because he has restricted free agency coming up. It's a similar situation to Austin Reeves, though he obviously hasn't been as effective as Austin Reeves. He isn't commanding the same type of money, but there is uh, a situation now where the Lakers have this guy that has basically been more of like a ninth or 10th man that I think is going to have some market. Like I think there will be smart teams that target Max Christie as an underrated three and D prospect where, I mean, people forget he's just turned 21. Like he's younger than he's going to be younger than several guys taken in the first round of this upcoming draft. And the fact that he's already showed, uh, he, I mean, last year was basically 41% on catch and shoot threes. He's a plus rebounder for a shooting guard. Uh, he's had some pretty impressive defensive moments. Like this is a guy who has potential just needs to be in the right role, needs to be given uh, confidence and and, and trusted in in a certain role and certain responsibilities that I don't think uh, the Lakers have done uh, up to this point. So I I think internally from the front office, they've been pleased with him. Now, I will say his three-point shooting has slightly declined this season. He was about a 41% three-point shooter last year. That's down to closer to 36%. Uh, His catch and shoot rate has dropped from about 41% uh, to just under 38%. So you'd like to see those numbers stabilize a little bit higher. There is, I know it sounds uh, like like a minuscule difference, but there is a big difference between being a 38% catch and shoot guy versus a 41% catch and shoot guy. I mean, that that could be a millions of dollars in in terms of your value and and your perception around the league. Uh, So Max returning to those levels, uh, I think would, would do wonders for his role and just his value and his perception, but he's continued to rebound the ball well. I think he's grown as a defender. He's, I think he's more confident. Uh, his two-point, like, so his three-point percentage has declined, but his two-point percentage has gotten better. And you've seen his ability to attack closeouts, to attack gaps as a cutter, and just his basketball IQ and him figuring out his role offensively has grown. So Max is someone that the Lakers continue to be high on. I think he's going to be a priority for them this offseason in terms of trying to retain him. But there has been a bit of a disagreement in terms of how the front office views him as a longer term piece and how the coaching staff has deployed him. And that's not necessarily unique to just this situation. We, we see it all the time where front office drafts a guy or, or signs a guy, uh, a young player, and They view him in a certain way, and and the coaching staff maybe wants more win-now guys. And I think for uh, the the coaching staff, they view Torian and and Cam as more win-now guys. I mean, at this point, it seems unlikely that like his role kind of is what it is. He's on the fringes of the rotation. I I don't expect him to be a playoff rotation guy, as especially if if Gabe's coming back, if if Vando's coming back, if Cam Reddish is coming back at some point. Like Max is getting pushed down the pecking order. I I think he's shown some growth, uh, particularly as a two-point finisher finisher at the rim, but overall, just as a a defensive guy, I think he's grown. And again, I think he's going to be a priority for the Lakers this offseason. Next question from at Tritty24. Spencer Dinwiddie has impacted games more as of late, even though not seen in the stat sheet. And from memory, I think his plus minus has been pretty solid since joining LA. Despite that, why do you think he struggled offensively and with his shot selection since joining Lakerland? So I have it here. Since joining the Lakers on February 13th, Spencer Dinwiddie leads the team in plus minus at plus 42. Uh, LeBron is second at plus 36. Anthony Davis is third at plus 33. Austin Reeves is fourth at plus 14. And D'Angelo Russell is fifth at plus eight. So (laughs) as you see there, uh, Spencer Dinwiddie has made an impact. And I think the Spencer edition has been fascinating just because he's helped the Lakers, just not in the way that he was billed to or, or, or projected to, right? Because he was supposed to come in, be the third guard, 
and and be a stabilizing offensive presence off the bench. This is a guy who was one of the leading scorers on a team that made the Western Conference Finals. Uh, he was part of that Dallas team. Of course, Luca gets most of the credit and deservedly so, but Spencer was a big part of that. He made key shots. He had key games uh, along the way uh, to, to them making that run to the conference finals. So this is a guy who has been in some big playoff moments and, and had some big games, a guy who's put up 18, 20 points a night uh, for stretches of his career. So it's not like he's a scrub, right? And, and he was coming off of a pretty big role offensively with the Brooklyn team that wasn't very good. But uh, looking at Spencer and his skill set, it looked like you could scale that down to him being just more of a uh, combo bench guard who can come in and get you 10, 12, 14 points a night. And that just hasn't really happened up to this point. Uh, but what he has done is impact the game from a defensive perspective and I think from a basketball IQ perspective. To me, he's been a good ball mover. He's made the right reads. He's made a lot of good decisions offensively. Uh, Hasn't been a lot of him creating for himself, but he has been looking to extract maximum value offensively. And then defensively, I mean, we could look at the game ceiling block against Damian Lillard, but I thought he did a an underrated job against Klay Thompson in that Warriors game where Max Christie and Torian Prince had struggled against Klay Thompson, chasing him around screens and really staying disciplined, not falling for pump fakes uh, and, and really just locking into him. I've been really impressed with his defense overall. And it was an area where watching the film, you know, I went back and watched some of his his defensive clips on Synergy and you see the physical tools and and he's six foot six as a good wingspan and a solid foot speed, you know, not the quickest guy, but I think can bother smaller players and and, and quicker players uh, just with his length and ability to stay with them, but wasn't always engaged, wasn't always active, wasn't always focused defensively in Brooklyn, but he's fully embraced that role with the Lakers. He's been something of a glue guy, something of the dirty work guy. And I thought the Milwaukee game really highlighted that with his defense against Damian Lillard, not only uh, on on the final possession where he blocked him, but just in general in that game. And I, I didn't expect Spencer Dinwiddie to be the Lakers glue guy, but he's become that. And the numbers reflect that in terms of the plus minus and, and just the impact. But a couple things I'd like to see from, you know, one from him and, and one from the Lakers is, for him, you know, stop trying to get the maximum value from every possession. Like there are, there, there needs to be some possessions where he just calls his own number and he calls for a pick and roll or he calls for an ISO and he just keeps the defense honest by taking them off the dribble and creating a shot for himself. Like he needs to be better with his shot creation. And sometimes being a little bit more selfish can be selfless if you do it you know, within certain boundaries, certain parameters. Uh, and then for the Lakers, I, I think they need to do a better job of using him on the ball and, and letting him call his own number or forcing him to call his own number. And Lakers have two guys in Austin Reeves and, and D'Angelo Russell who are at their best with the ball in their hands, but are also capable off-ball players, capable catch-and-shoot guys, You know, better catch-and-shoot guys than Spencer Dinwiddie. That's the one thing. He's shooting 32% on catch and shoot threes in LA, that's not good enough. That's bad. So if the Lakers can find ways to have him have the ball a little bit more, let him do his own thing offensively, and then leverage D'Lo or Austin as the catch and shoot guys, the the weak side guys who they can go uh, as a weak side option into a a pick and roll or dribble handoff or or just, you know, leverage the defense that way. Um, I think that there are smarter and more creative ways to use Spencer Dinwiddie offensively. But overall, I think he's actually been a positive, again, with his defense, with, with his energy. He's just been the, the type of shape-shifting glue guy who can do different things within uh, the course of a lineup. I think he's he's helped on the glass. He, he's been active there, uh, boxing out, and, and just trying to be a, a physical presence there despite size limitations to some extent uh, as being a 6'6 slender guy. I think he's been better, for example, than like Torian Prince in that regard and actually making contact and, and, and cracking guys in the paint. So I know he's going to be compared to Gabe, and, and that's kind of the comparison of like, who's the better backup point guard? Who's the better third guy? Like in many ways to me, he's been a better version of Torian. And with the one exception being, of course, you know, Torian is the better shooter and, and will hit occasionally like a couple threes. And Spencer just hasn't been able to do that. But in terms of like the glue guy, dirty work stuff, Spencer has been much better than Torian at that. And I've been really impressed with the way that he's been able to come in and, and impact the Lakers uh, from that regard. Next question from at burner underscore literal. 
Do you think the Lakers will be fully healthy by April? This may be the question that defines the rest of the Lakers season because as currently constructed, this group to me just doesn't have enough on a night-to-night basis uh, from a defensive perspective. I think they really miss Jared Vanderbilt, Cam Reddish, Christian Wood, just that collective size and length and defensive rebounding. And then even to an extent, Gabe Vincent, though they haven't had him, I think that skill set as a 3 and D bench guard uh, could be valuable, you know, particularly his catch and shooting ability and then his point of attack defense. So those four guys, that's to say nothing of Anthony Davis and, and his potential absence, uh, depending on what happens with, with him and his corneal abrasion. But uh, assuming that AD at most misses just the Hawks game and, and is back Friday against Philly or, or just doesn't miss any time and it's just those four guys who've consistently been out recently i think all four have value to this group and maybe cam is the one guy where i look at okay if you have vando if you have gabe you have spencer and you have one of max or torian like you don't necessarily need cam uh, but the other three guys like christian provides certain things that jackson just can't provide he is a better shot blocker and rebounder than jackson though jackson is obviously uh you know more athletic and, and a better pick and roll finisher and, and a lob threat and an offensive rebounder uh, but christian has real value and then you have vando who uh, i already covered a lot of his value earlier but just as a switchable versatile defensive wing who's a good rebounder on both ends and was starting to figure things out as a cutter and a spot-up shooter he's I, to me, probably the Lakers' sixth best player overall after the five starters. And, and then you have Gabe Vincent, who was their primary offseason addition, who they've had uh, for only five games this season. So I think those, like w- whether those guys come back is going to be a huge factor in terms of the Lakers' ability to potentially move up to standings. And then you know, it's looking like they're going to be in the play-in. So if they are in the play-in, their ability to win those games, you know, the, the game or games, and then you potentially make some noise in the playoffs. As for the timelines with all these guys, um, I have heard, I uh, continue to hear that Gabe Vincent and Jared Vanderbilt are expected back before the end of the season, uh, though they have not returned yet to practice. They, they have not returned to on-court uh, activity in terms of contact. So we're running out of time. There, there's less than four weeks left in, in the regular season. Uh, Christian Wood was supposed to already be back uh, based on what I had heard, what others had reported, and we've yet to hear an update on that. So uh, this is the second, actually the third time that a knee effusion, uh, with the other two being Gabe Vincent, uh, which eventually led to him having surgery, and then Cam Reddish uh, have kept Lakers out for multiple weeks and longer than ex- uh, initially expected. So I don't have a great update on on Christian other than he was expected to already be back by this point. So um, I don't know if there's been a setback or what's the latest on that, but it sounds like he, he should be back relatively soon. But uh, again, I, I say that uh, a little hesitantly with the Lakers track record with injuries this year. Uh, and then Cam is uh, day-to-day. He is someone that he could play Monday against Atlanta, could play Friday against Philly. Like he, he should be back w- within the week. So to answer your question, I think the four guys that are currently out should be back. But given the Lakers' luck and their injury history this season, I find it difficult to say that all four will be back by April and that there won't be something else that happens before then. And really, like LeBron is still dealing with this ankle injury, so LeBron's not going to be fully healthy by April. So by that, I will say no. I don't think the Lakers will be fully healthy at any point this season. I think there's a chance they could have everyone fully available. But just by virtue of LeBron dealing with his ankle injury, it's seeming like uh, whether it's Gabe or, or Christian or, or Vando, some of this stuff is going to be lingering and they might just have to return and kind of play through it. Uh, I don't think they're going to be fully healthy. I do think there's a chance though, again, they could have all their bodies available, but in terms of like full health, everyone's ready to play, uh, you know, X amount of minutes and, and, and play it as, as much as needed. I'm a little skeptical that that ultimately happens. And last question from at C Fang one, two, three, Love your reporting and videos, Jovan. Appreciate you for what you do. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, what do you think about the players who are on one-year vet mins? Do you think they stay with the Lakers, a.k.a. Hayes, Prince, Reddish, and Dinwiddie? So I will add Christian Wood into this group, and I will also point out that Torian Prince technically is not making a minimum contract. He was signed with the biannual exception. So he's making slightly more at $4.5 million. Uh, but looking at Hayes, Reddish, Wood, Dinwiddie, and I'll throw Prince in there. Uh, just just for argument's sake. I think with minimum guys, you see there is more turnover in terms of them kind of jumping roster to roster. Even looking at the Lakers rosters in recent years, they've tended to have 
a lot of minimum guys on their rosters and like year over year they haven't really retained many of them like you know Dwight was an exception uh, although he came back he he wasn't there in consecutive years Rondo th- there's been a few guys Markeef Morris uh, like there there's been guys who have stayed uh, or you know stayed for for consecutive seasons or, or multiple seasons uh, but it is rare uh, you know typically there is another team calling with maybe a similar amount of money but a larger role and uh, when you're a minimum guy you are constantly looking for what is the best basketball situation for my next contract? Is there a situation? And that's where the Lakers have excelled in recent years with like Malik Monk and Stanley Johnson and Lonnie Walker and Troy Brown, like giving these guys minimum contracts and, and giving them exposure that leads to them getting bigger contracts or, or bigger roles elsewhere. Uh, so quickly, I guess my read on, on these five guys would be, I think there's a chance Hayes is back. I, I think he's fit in well. I think the Lakers have been pleasantly surprised and pleased with his production. And he could be a type of guy who, who just ends up becoming the, the backup center moving forward. And like the Lakers probably need a, a bigger, more defensive minded uh, alternative to him. But I think him and his current role could fit well uh, alongside AD, alongside LeBron. And like he, he's really found his groove over the last like month, month and a half, uh, probably month and a half to, to maybe even a little longer. Uh, Prince, I don't think will be back. Uh, and there are several reasons why. I think it's just been not the best fit. I think for, from the Lakers, like for a $4.5 million player, I think he has met, if not exceeded expectations, uh, but he's also kind of become the scapegoat of the season. I don't think he's loved that on, on some level. And I'm sure there, there's part of the Lakers uh, front office that would love to not have him on the team uh, to play over guys that probably should be playing ahead of him like a Max Christie, or even at times an Austin Reeves and a D'Angelo Russell. So I'm sure the Lakers will go in a different direction. Darvin Ham might push back against that as he pushed back at the trade deadline in terms of uh, trading uh, Prince. But we'll we'll see we'll see who wins out that that uh, you know tug of war in, in terms of keeping Prince. But I think he's a he's a guy who's likely going elsewhere. Reddish is probably a similar situation where you, maybe because of the clutch ties, uh, because Darvin is fond of him. Um, and, and that's assuming Darwin's back. We, we, we don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, like maybe he's a guy who stays too, but I think he probably wants a role that he can grow in offensively. I think there's a clear limitation on this team in terms of his, like they, they wanted him to be a three and D catch and shoot guy. And I think he ultimately wants to do a little bit more offensively. That's been what he's wanted to do in previous stops. And he hasn't really been able to do that in LA. So Cam, I could see that's kind of more 50-50 um, Christian, I think, probably goes somewhere else and you know looks for a more. His minutes have kind of been up and down throughout the seasons, so I could see him prioritizing a bigger role as like the primary clear cut backup big. Spencer, to me, is the, the one that's the most interesting, just because he hasn't played great offensively, but he has been a productive role player. And if you can retain him on a minimum contract or even a biannual exception or one of your smaller exceptions, I do think he's a really interesting fit with this group. Uh, but that, of course assumes he wants to stay, that he is content with having a smaller offensive role, maybe a hometown discount, a lot of different factors there. But uh, my rule of thumb is is minimum guys tend to move on. They very rarely stay year over year in the same situation. So I would say probably all these guys are more likely on different teams next season. But I look at Hayes, I look at Reddish, and I look at Dinwiddie as three uh, of the five that could potentially be Lakers Uh, moving forward. So that'll do it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you did on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, make sure you download the podcast, make sure you follow the podcast, make sure you leave a five-star review, share it with your friends and family. And a quick reminder, if you want me to answer one of your questions, just send me a screenshot on Twitter that you have either followed, downloaded, or left a five-star review. And I'll be back on Friday for episode six with a special guest. Talk to you soon.